Hello, uh, my name is Adrian Liu, and what I'd like to do today is to talk to you about making maps of the universe, cosmic map making. Now, the reason we do this is because maps really teach us a lot about a place, you know, how it operates, its history, and that's true even if we have a static map. And to understand that, we can look at a familiar map. Here is a map of Hong Kong. Um, and what you can see is that even though this isn't a movie, I can look at the network of highways and that teaches me about some that teaches me something about how people commute. Where do they live? Where do they work? What are the arteries of the city? Um, and indeed, if I were to look at traffic flows, which is another type of map, what you see here is the cross harbor to central cross harbor tunnel. Um, being lit up in yellow, and so that really tells you something about how people operate here. Here's another example. Um, two different cities in India, Bangalore and Chandigarh. And this these maps tell you something about how the city grew. For instance, Bangalore, you see a lot of um, streets that are curved. Um, it, this does not look like a very planned city just kind of grew organically. Chandigarh, on the other hand, you see these very, very regular blocks. Um, this is an extremely planned experience. Okay, uh, And similarly in North America, uh, you've got Boston versus Chicago. Boston, again, uh, kind of grew out historically um, with a lot of curvy streets. Chicago, these very straight streets and avenue uh, due to the Burnham plan in the early 1900s, a very conscious urban planning exercise. You can also have hybrids, Barcelona, and that also tells you something about the history. If I zoom in into the middle of Barcelona, what I have is the historic part of the city, the central part of the city, um, surrounded by fortified walls, where you have basically um, not very regular patterns. But um, at some point, the city kind of outgrew its boundaries. And uh, Cerda, in 1860, did a big urban planning exercise. And so beyond the sort of um, uh, historic old part of Barcelona, you see these very regular blocks, these avenues. Um, and in interestingly, even though this was in the 1800s, uh, Serda actually uh, foresaw this idea of automobiles, and part, that was part of the motivation behind uh, designing these big avenues. So one interesting thing is that we can learn a lot of interesting things about a city by studying its map. And it's the same with astrophysics. We make maps of the universe and we can learn about it. And what's uh, and one interesting thing is that um, we actually see a lot of analogies between city maps and the universe. So for instance, here's a map of uh, the northeast, the east coast of North America. And what I've done is I've removed the labels from this map. And if I had to ask you, you know, if you had to guess where the cities are, what you would probably guess is, well, they're probably where the highways intersect. So if I look for intersections of highways um, and I circle them like this, what you find when I put the labels back is indeed these circles correspond to Montreal, Boston, New York, Washington, DC, for instance, okay? Uh, here's a map of China. Um, same sort of idea, remove the labels, got a lot of highways here. Um, and again, if you study this very closely, look at where the highways come together. Um, you can draw a few circles here. And indeed, you can see cities like Shanghai, Beijing, Wuhan, and so on. If, you want, if one looks at the universe, um, you will get a picture like this. So this is a simulation. This is not a real observation, but... Um, we have observed structures like what we saw with the highways. What you find is that there are these cosmic filaments in our universe consisting of gas, dust, stars, and so on. And it's 
again, at the intersections of these cosmic highways that we have our galaxies, our clusters of galaxies, where most of the star formation happens. Uh, if I were to watch a, a movie of a theory simulation of this, you can see even more of an analogy um, where what happens is that just as in human society, the highways are often the supply lines for a city where trucks come in with supplies, go out um, with products and so on. Uh, same sort of thing with our cosmic filamentary structure. These are our um, highways where gas is flowing in and fueling star formation and giving it its raw materials it needs to form stars. Okay. Now, we can actually make this more quantitative. One thing we can ask is, well, if I'm standing in a galaxy, um, how far do I have to travel before I'm likely to find another galaxy? Okay, so it'd be like asking if I'm in the city, how far do I have to travel to find another city because I wanna go on vacation or something? So what I can do is I can say, well, okay, given some distance from the center of a galaxy, how likely am I to find another galaxy? You know, how likely am I to find another galaxy 100 million light years away, you know, 200 million light years away, and so on. And if you actually go out and make observations, make maps of our galaxies, uh, of where the galaxies are in our universe, and you actually compute this, what you find is uh, a plot like this. And what's very interesting is you find that um, very close to your galaxy, you have a very high probability of finding another galaxy. And that's because galaxies like to clump together. They feel each other's gravity. They draw each other um, towards each other. And as you go farther and farther away, I'm less likely to find another galaxy. But there is also some magic distance which in cosmology we call the baryon acoustic oscillation scale, where you are just a tiny bit extra likely to find um, another galaxy. You can actually see a lot of the same trends if you look at how cities are distributed. So here's a digitized map of uh, night lights from say a satellite photograph of North America. And you can ask, okay, um, what is how how likely am I to find another city as a function of distance from, say, the city that I'm currently in? And if you plot this, you get something that's very, very similar. You, for instance, get um, very close to a city. You are very likely to find another city, right? With a big city, you often have little towns surrounding it. Cities like to cluster. But interestingly, kind of around four or 500 kilometers, you're also, you've got this extra little bump. You're extra likely to find another city. Um, and this could be a coincidence. Um, it could also be suggestive of how humans like to operate and how our cities like to operate. 400 kilometers, for example, is roughly the distance between Boston and New York. 500 kilometers is about the distance between Montreal and Toronto. So that might say something about how far apart big cities can be before we kind of need another city. But that's speculation. Now, although it's true that the maps that we deal with as humans, like maps of cities, uh, atlases, and so on, are very similar to maps of our universe, there are also some differences. For instance, in a map of a universe, the farther away we look, the farther back in time we're seeing, okay? And the reason for that is that we are looking at our universe through light <clears throat> and light takes time to travel to our telescopes from the distant regions of the universe, okay? The speed of light is not infinite. So for instance, if this is us, if I am looking at a part of the universe 10 light years away, I am looking at old light. I'm looking at, by definition, light that started traveling towards us 10 years ago. So this is out of date information. I'm actually seeing an image of the past. 
If I look 20 light years away, I'm seeing the universe as it was 20 years ago, and I can go on and on and on, which is another way of saying that if I make a truly gigantic map of our universe, um, the inner regions of this map will be will represent a more recent universe, whereas the farther out regions represent the older universe. So um, the far away things are, the more out of date. And this is kind of the reverse of a lot of cities, right? We talked about Barcelona, where the, the central part um, was kind of part, parts of the oldest um, parts of the city, whereas going further out, things are newer. And Beijing's another example. In the middle, you've got the Forbidden City, very old historic part. But, you know, the um, newer parts are the parts surrounding Beijing. You're kind of building out. And again, that's the opposite of what we see. Now, this might seem very counterintuitive to us, but this is actually just because we are so used to these days with our cell phones and our and email and all that of instantaneous, of you know, near instantaneous information transfer. But if you talk to someone from hundreds of years ago about this, this would be a perfectly natural idea to them. So one way to think about it is to tell a story. And, you know, we can go back to the 1700s. It's February 1778. Um, America is busy fighting the uh, in war of, American War of Independence against the British. Um, and it's not going so great. Okay. Um, and they send Benjamin Franklin over to France, asking France for help. But it's February, um, and Benjamin has gone for a while now, um, and he still hasn't come back and, you know, done anything really. So John Adams is getting a little anxious, and he said, I have to go go to France and see what's going on. Right. So it's February 17th, and he um, set sail from Boston, um, and on April 1st, 1778, he finally arrives in Paris. Now, perhaps it's fitting that he arrived on April Fool's Day because joke was on him. Um, Benjamin Franklin says, what? You know, we already entered an alliance on February 6th. That was 11 days before you left Boston. Why did you come? Well, what John Adams says is, well, it takes a month and a half for letters to cross the Atlantic. How could I have known? Okay. So we can think about a map of John Adams's, John Adams's knowledge of the world in mid-February 1778 when he was about to set sail. Okay. Um, anything in his hometown of Boston where he was living, any news he had, any information he had was completely up to date, right? Something happened down the street, he knows. But if he wanted to know about something in northern Quebec, say, okay, it takes, you know, a horseback ride a bunch of time to get, you know, through the wilderness down to Boston. So the most up-to-date information he could possibly have in northern Quebec would have been from late January 1778. Okay, so the farther, his information from farther away is more out of date. Going even further. Right? Any information he had from Paris in mid-February 1778 would have had to have left Paris in early January 1778. So a map of John Adams's universe would have had an even older um, picture of Paris. Okay, And so very naturally, because it took time for letters to reach John Adams, just as it takes time for light to get to us from the distant regions of the universe, we end up with um, maps of our universe that are very old, um, far, far out, and very young, close by. And that's actually a great thing, because that means that to understand my universe's history, all I need to do is make a very big map, right? If it's big enough, uh, the far away parts are gonna be old enough, I will literally be seeing a picture of the universe when it was younger. So I do that by using telescopes like the Hydrogen Epic of Reionization Array, which is built in the South African Karoo Desert. It's a radio telescope and actually consists of lots of smaller radio dishes that together work as a super telescope um, 
to, uh, to make maps of the universe. And what we hope to be able to understand is the process uh, by which the first galaxies formed. And in this theory simulation, this movie, what you're seeing actually isn't the first set of galaxies. What you're seeing are the first galaxies polluting the universe. These first galaxies uh, give off lots of light, lots of energetic forms of light, and they go out to, uh, and ionize the atoms in the space between the galaxies. So these blue ionized bubbles are, if you like, the galaxy's way of polluting our cosmos. You can study these maps in very much the same way as you study a map of pollution around cities. Okay, um, And this can actually help us understand the nature of the first galaxies. So let's contrast two different situations. Okay, um, One pretty polluted area in the world is uh, Los Angeles, LA. Okay. If so, now LA doesn't really have like a a strong downtown city center. Okay, um, it's really a lot of smaller suburban towns cobbled together to form LA County. So you can think about pollution coming from LA as like lots of little bits of pollution, um, each contributing to cover you know the pollution across all of LA. On the left, I've got a simulation of uh, the effects of how the galaxies would have polluted the universe if we had lots of little galaxies, each polluting the universe ti a tiny bit. Okay, So you end up with uh, lots of smallish blue bubbles of pollution. And this stands in contrast to a situation like if you had New York, okay, um, where you've got a very strong downtown, um, and you've got a giant, giant city doing all of the pollution, uh, almost all of the pollution in the area. And if our galaxies works like that, you'd see the picture in the bottom left here, where you've got um, a few galaxies dominating the pollution, creating these big spherical bubbles. Right. So by studying these maps, we can understand things about nature of first generation galaxies. So in conclusion, maps tell us a lot about the dynamics of a, of a place and how it came to be. Um, and this is why a lot of us are trying to assemble the biggest map ever, um, because by doing so, we can study and understand the universe, its nature, and how it came to be. Thank you very much.